Today on CityCast DC, so the pandemic changed where you work. And as a result, it is still changing where the people who sell you stuff want to set up shop. In the DC area, this has meant jobs and people moving from downtown to neighborhoods and from city to suburb, among other things. Will it last? And what are our local governments doing to recruit business or protect the tax base? Tristan Navarra from the Washington Business Journal is here to explain. Today is Wednesday, August 16th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. So national stats show that the number of businesses is on the rise, but in the district, more companies have left the city than have come in. And likewise, we're seeing that employees who left during the height of the pandemic, they're coming back to the region, but not to the district itself. So Tristan, what is going on here? It's actually pretty alarming when you when you look at it. Uh, part of the benefit that we've seen in the past couple of years is that a lot of people are working remotely and a lot of people are interested in starting their own companies. I think COVID made all of us stop and pause and think about what we wanted to do with our lives. Well, you combine those two factors and people are able to start new companies, but when they do that, they're often looking for cheaper places, which has meant that they are moving out of DC, which given a number of other problems the city's facing right now is just another thing. So this is like a weird thing to, I mean, your reporting it looked pretty hard you know, to gather the stats because typically federal stats on employment have to do with where the job is, not where the employee happens to be sitting. So it's not just as easy as, as pulling economic stats here. Where are the jobs and people going? Thank you for, for noting that. It was tough. And part of the reason that it's tough is that it is so hard to track some of this stuff. That means the situation could be worse for D.C. than we even realize. The data on where people are moving their businesses has shown a preference for moving generally to cheaper places, anywhere that people can. Some of these businesses are moving to suburban Maryland and northern Virginia, um, but some of them are moving to Nashville. Some of them are moving to Charlotte. Some of them are moving to Pittsburgh. What kind of businesses are we talking about in both cases? The biggest departures tend to be in professional services. These tend to be single employer companies or, you know, startups, maybe someone is starting a consulting business or maybe a, a tax business or maybe a lawyer is going into practice for himself. So these are not like factories closing. They're just like some person hanging their shingle someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that doesn't sound by itself like a problem in the short term. The bigger problem comes when a lot more companies start doing this. When you have more of these companies moving, for instance, to Northern Virginia, first of all, they're moving because they can, because they're mobile in, in ways that they didn't used to be. And when a lot of these companies move out to the suburbs, as we've seen, you see the restaurants and you see the entertainment and you see these other kind of businesses following them. At the same time, as these businesses move out and get established and grow, they're not putting roots down in, in D.C. and other urban areas like they used to, which is kind of a double whammy. Which is to say, people who... If they were employees of a company in D.C., they might have been more likely to look for a house in D.C. If they're employees of a company in Virginia, they'll look for a house close to there. So the, the city's theory of the case on this, at least as, as it's been conveyed to me, and I'm not like a business reporter like you are, it has been, look, federal workers aren't coming downtown. A lot of workers aren't coming downtown. Therefore, they're not going out at midday to shop or eat or spend money. Therefore, a lot of those jobs are imperiled. And if you bring the workers back, the jobs will come back, everything will be back to normal. But your reporting is actually not about like the person who works at the lunch joint. What about the other businesses, The this uh, hypothetical uh, small consultancy that you've raised? Why are they leaving? I mean, you, you mentioned housing costs and taxes, but at least between D.C. and the Burbs, D.C. has always been more expensive and higher tax. So w what is it that changed now? Well, a big part of it is more folks are finding that they can do these these jobs from home. And in a long-term way, do them from home. It's more accepted. They can meet on Zoom with their clients. They can start up a business. And if they want to, um, they can go and find a co-working space, maybe, or a coffee shop where they can set up. A lot of these companies that were in downtown D.C. for the people, for the networking, for the proximity to 
other, you know, major firms are finding, well, I go down to DC and there's not that many people around. My office building is usually empty. I can just do this from home, which is cheaper anyway. And I can move out to a cheaper place and still not lose the clients that I might lose not having FaceTime in downtown. Right. So a few years ago, people might have thought like, I don't know if I want to hire this guy. He doesn't even have a real office. But nowadays, that sort of permission has been created. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, as a result of this, you know, D.C. maybe is going to have an even harder time recovering economically from covid than we might have at first realized. Um, we knew that DC was struggling before. We knew that people not coming back to the office is bad for you know some of those restaurant and, and service industry jobs. But this is even worse because as the economy improves and as we see in Northern Virginia has really recovered from the pandemic in certain ways, DC isn't going to see the same benefit from a larger regional economy growing. We'll come back to DC's response, but one of the things <laughs> that struck me in your reporting is that the benefit, insofar as businesses that relocate within the region and places that are more economically vibrant within the region, it's all Virginia. Maryland does not seem to have benefited from the departures from DC. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, you know, there's a couple of different theories on that. And, you know, we looked at information from the Fuller Institute at George Mason, as well as uh, the DC Policy Center. Part of the problem seems to be housing. There is generally a cheaper housing potential in Virginia because it sprawls more. There's a, uh, a more friendly tax rate. Virginia is more generous on economic incentives. Some of these things come together uh, to say Virginia maybe is the more attractive of the two, whereas Maryland has had kind of different housing policy that's created its own set of problems. So Maryland, it's not to say that they're doing the same. It's not D.C. and Maryland are in the same boat. But the three different regions now are facing three different realities, and Maryland is having some of the same problems as D.C. and not as many of the advantages as Virginia. So you did another piece, a very good piece, where you talked to two different startup founders uh, who left, in one case, to Memphis, which you know I don't think of as a hot destination full of like creative class professionals. But these are like young women entrepreneurs, Howard grads. And they could have stayed here, should have uh -huh. stayed here by the conventional wisdom and didn't. What did they tell you about why? Well, you know, this is a larger problem for D.C. You think of how many people you know from this region who aren't from here. I mean, we joke about it. You know, nobody is from D.C. You can speak for yourself. <laughs> you know, but uh, people typically move for opportunities to this city. And in many of these cases during COVID, you've seen a lot of stories of people deciding that maybe corporate life or maybe a certain kind of life isn't for them and they want to go and do something, you know, more meaningful to them. Those startups are not being developed here in the ways that they used to be. People aren't establishing the same roots here that they used to. It's not just in D.C. It's every city. I mean, people are leaving New York in the same way. The problem is those startups eventually become big companies. And when they do become big companies, they're going to do it somewhere that isn't here. And that means a lot of missed opportunity for economic recovery. Let's talk about DC. As you say, like these are not big companies. These are little, you know, one person's decision, you know, their mom got sick and they wanted to move someplace. And mm -hmm. another person might have decided because they like the weather. You know, there's a million reasons people decide all kinds of things. And you are now more free than you've ever been to have your tastes dictate where you live rather than your economic needs. But in the aggregate, they do mean something very big for DC and for those of us who do live here. Can you like, like, what are we talking about in terms of the tax base of the city, in terms of what the consequences are if there's less economic activity? Yeah, well, it's in this case, it we're really looking at a lose, lose, lose. We're looking at some big potential changes coming down the pike that nobody's going to like. I'll put it like that. DC has this benefit of a lot of well-educated people in professional services jobs. A lot of times those jobs are very easy to move. You can move a consulting firm without as much trouble as perhaps a restaurant or a retail store. If we come into a place where we permanently don't have to do these jobs in an office, DC is going to find it's getting outcompeted by 
suburbs and other smaller cities around the country. And that's going to mean, you know, the restaurants are going to follow them. You know, we're going to continue seeing this problem with the offices downtown being empty. And eventually, as those landlords are not able to, you know, continue to bring in the same tax revenue as before, DC is going to try and find other ways to get that money. So taxes will go up or services will get worse. Well, specifically, it's going to be more calls for taxes on residents. The district is not going to be able to get the same kinds of taxes that it did before from commercial activity, from companies having big office space downtown, from those big landlords paying, that sort of thing. So they're going to have to rely on other ways to bring in tax revenue. The Policy Center recommended maybe um, some form of tax for renters who are working from home, counting basically as some kind of a commercial activity tax, because D.C. doesn't have that many other revenues to get the money that it needs to pay for its services. Now, listen, you watch the city's long-term economic health, and, and I remember seeing a presentation by Stephen Fuller, the namesake of the Fuller Institute, a long time, sort of the dean of academic experts on the D.C. economy, going like way before COVID, this is probably 2017, saying, hey, you know, we all think we're living in boom times in D.C., but ever since the austerity of like 2011, other cities have been growing faster than the district and that it looks glittery and prosperous. But what we've done is created an economy full of like busboys and waiters <laughs> instead of one full of like people who work at consulting firms and government contractors and make six figures. And that that in the long term is dangerous, which is just to say, Bowser could have seen this all coming pre-COVID. Why has it taken COVID to kind of focus everyone's attention on this? The rapidness of COVID and some of the tendencies that have just stuck around since the pandemic are the big factor. I remember in 2020, a commercial real estate developer telling me in two years, remote work is going to be a thing of the past. I think a lot of people have understood for a long time, well, the district is more expensive than Virginia. Well, historically, the pendulum kind of shifts back and forth between downtowns and suburbs. We've had this before where suddenly the suburbs became more attractive. But this was an economic shock. I had an economist tell me it's like Alaska losing oil overnight. D.C.'s basically greatest economic output is in well-educated people in highly paid jobs. If they don't ever have to go back into the office in the same way, D.C. is not going to really be able to, to keep those people because it can't compete as far as affordability and it can't compete as far as, you know, mobility and some of those kinds of things that have always been its draw in the past. So I know because we did an episode on this, uh -huh. one of the things that D.C. is trying to do to arrest this trend or turn it around is to really sort of change the character of downtown D.C., make it much yeah. more residential, more fun, a place that either you'll live there or you'll want to work there because there's so much fun stuff going on. There's people who think that is a very unlikely and expensive scenario. Are there other, like, maybe more immediate things that the city is uh, trying to do? I mean, what you're describing a kind of very, very dangerous scenario. And what kind of things are smart people in the city government doing to try to avert this scenario? Well, there are a few different levers that, that we can pull, and every one of them carries its own problems. There has been some conversation among kind of the policy wonks about figuring out new ways to tax residents for working at home. That hasn't seen a lot of appetite in D.C. It's happening in other cities. D.C. is definitely trying to diversify its economy and bring in more kind of tourist attractions, which is where you've seen kind of recently talking with the, the Therm Group, uh, this European company, about potentially doing kind of a wellness resort somewhere in the city. I've heard about that, too, and it might be a fun day trip. I have a hard time imagining that people who live elsewhere and they're thinking of wellness destinations, they're going to pick the District of Columbia. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that I came to D.C. to go to a water park. Wasn't maybe the first thing on my mind, but... There you go. <laughs> But so, I mean, there's also like little things like they have this $2 million new small business grant. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of thing you could get if you were, you know, a founder of a tech startup that might move to Memphis or a consultant who might decide to uh, stay home in Gaithersburg? Well, it's, I think they're trying a bunch of different ideas to see if 
you combine them together to to help improve the fortunes for the district. I mean, you know, these startups, like the few that we in, you know interviewed, you know, they need several different rounds of funding. They need a lot of support to get off the ground. And you're going to find more of these kinds of programs are effective when they work in tandem. So grant programs are going to work with economic incentives for cheaper rent, or maybe, you know, DC seems like it's trying to start kind of a small business incubator kind of ecosystem in the West End. They're just kind of getting started with that. What's your hunch? What do you think would bring people back (laughs) if you were king? You know, this is going to be another conversation we're going to hear about over the next couple of years. But, you know, downtown D.C. needs to feel more like a neighborhood. I'm not going to say that I have all the answers on this one, but in the next couple of years, you know, know, I'm in my mid 30s. Probably at some point here going to start a family that changes the calculus on everything. You know, you want to have a place where you can have a park where you can take your kids. You want to be able to walk to school. You want to be able to get your groceries. But you know, downtown is this kind of glass canyon right now. And as these DC officials are saying, you know, this is something that needs to change. It's not necessarily easy, but it isn't just about adding a bunch more apartments for a bunch of uh, Gen Z kids. There's got to be parks. There's got to be more programming at the parks. There's got to be, you know, more of what I would call the Tuesday night restaurants, you know, yeah, just a combination of all of these things. All right, one last question, since you've you've kind of ruined our day here. Man. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, your reporting is suggests this is a really big problem. It's really serious yeah, stuff. Yeah. The people you have interviewed within the, the elected world, the city the executive branch or the city council, do you, you get the sense that they view it with the same seriousness that you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think there's an understanding that we're at a tough time for D.C., there are a lot of ugly headlines. There's a lot of dense reporting like mine. I'm sorry if, if I'm uh, sounding really wonky here today. And I wish that I was coming to you with a much happier story about, you know, puppy parks. But this is why you're going to see a lot of conversation about big changes in the district in the next couple of years. Because there isn't a sign that these trends are going to change unless they are compelled to change. Tristan Navarra, thank you so much for being here. Well, hey, thanks, Michael. And now for some quick news. I'm here with our audio producer, Julia. What's happening, Julia? Representative Andy Ogles filed a bill to repeal the D.C. Home Rule Act, which allows the city to have some autonomy. Think voting in a mayor and council, but we still have to get congressional approval on local laws. Ogles said Congress should retake its, quote, constitutional authority, unquote, over the district because of D.C.'s rising crime rate. Meanwhile, the owners of Ristorante Piccolo have pleaded guilty to tax evasion and spending thousands of COVID-19 relief funds on personal investments. In total, the restaurateurs owed $1.3 million in taxes. They also used the $738,000 from the emergency relief funds to buy a waterfront condo in Ocean City, construct two homes in Great Falls, complete home improvement projects, and fund vacations and their child's college tuition. Also, the Pentagon is planning to restructure the D.C. National Guard in response to criticism about how it handled the January 6th insurrection and 2020 protests. The DOD is considering getting D.C. more military police for crowd control and transferring away some planes. But it's unclear who would control the D.C. Guard. Currently, the federal government is in charge, but for years, Mayor Muriel Bowser and other local officials have said that the city should have sole authority to deploy the force. Finally, a federal appeals court stood by Maryland schools' right to create support plans for transgender or gender nonconforming students without the knowledge or consent of the student's parents. The judge threw out the case challenging those guidelines, saying that the parents who filed the lawsuit did not have children who were impacted and that their claims of harm were invalid. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. I'm Michael Schaefer from Politico. I want to thank those of you who have subscribed to our show and sent in feedback. We've been blown away by the support. And if you haven't, uh, shame on you. Kidding. But subscribe now and check out our morning newsletter too. We'll be back on Thursday with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.